one person said the course made their investments grow by $67,000 in one year. It was like, oh my God, like I think the people in my course are doing better than me with my own advice. Like it's so ironic. Every year for the course, I put out the top 50 US stocks, top 50 Canadian stocks and top ETFs. These are just PDFs I give out. And like, I just did a mid-year check-in on them. And like the US stocks were up like 27%. And I was like looking at this list and I'm like, why didn't I just buy like everything that I actually, like I bought some of them for myself, but I'm like, holy crap, I just need to start like investing the way I tell other people to invest. Cause everyone else is like, oh yeah, I bought those and it's doing super well. And I'm like, I'm literally, people are doing better than me in my own program is what's happened there. So. <laughs> This is the Personal Finance Show. Hi, I'm Bo Humphreys, and this is the Personal Finance Show. Bridget Casey wants us all to get rich together. The good news is that Bridget already did most of the work for you. All you have to do is follow her instructions. You don't have to spend years studying the stock market and get an MBA in finance. She already did that, so you don't have to. Bridget took all of her personal finance skills and education and spent countless hours crafting online courses for you. Her standout course is called the Six Figure Stock Portfolio. She created this course because there's nothing like it online right now, and as you heard in the intro clip, her students are doing very well. Bridget started her website Money After Graduation in 2012, and today she has over 3,000 visitors per day. Bridget also makes personal finance videos on YouTube where she has over 6,500 subscribers and over 500,000 views of her videos. Bridget joined me from Edmonton, Alberta to share her personal finance story. hard to think about this question and I couldn't find one that stuck out because I always remember money in my household and I always remember money being very important particularly because we pretty much never had any okay well, that's a good memory <laughs> in like a in a stressful way because I remember like always being anxious about money like I even remember being anxious over my two dollar a week allowance that's why I can't remember like when that started. I mean, I have money memories as early as eight or nine years old, where I was like budgeting my allowance over like five cent candies at the Mac store. So you you were getting an allowance. Uh, yeah. You, you don't know when it started, but you you did get some money and you're budgeting it. So you what afford more expensive candies or? Yeah, well, I just understood that money ran out. Like that was the thing in my yeah. household is we were perpetually out of money. And I mean, I'm starting to talk more about this online before I really kept it hidden because I was so embarrassed. Now I don't understand sure. why I was embarrassed. But I think there is like a lot of embarrassment and shame with poverty. And it was... Yeah, I just like hit it all and now I'm a little bit more open with it. But like, I just remember my household, like money always ran out. And so in my mind, that's what I think, like money always runs out. And I just felt like I had to watch my allowance so closely because it would just like disappear. <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. And the funny thing is like, it was so small. We're really talking about like $2, $2 a week and over like yeah. those five cent or 10 cent candies, like it was gone really fast and I was, it'd be like three days later and I'm like, oh no, like I have no money until the end of the week. <laughs> so. Was it just candies? Is that, is that like, you didn't really have anything else to buy or like were you? No, it was, to... it was just candy. It's like maybe I'd get a Slurpee sometimes, but I think those cost like a dollar thirty five. So they were, they were a oh, big. Oh yeah, that's a lot to save. Uh... Thing. Yeah. I never yeah. could save up for like a Barbie or anything because it was just too much money. And so I started doing like side jobs and I used to like negotiate with my mom. Like one time I got to do this like list of chores and she would give me $5 a week. And that was like, Whoa. I was balling when I got to that <laughs> level. That's right. Yeah. It was just like scarcity from birth with the money is the best way to describe it. 
Yeah, that's a great early money memory. I mean, it doesn't have to be specific. I don't have a lot of specific things until I was like 12 and, you know, I, I gambled for the first time. And, of course, I, I think of that because that's my that's my history. Right? Yeah. Other than that, I really don't remember what I did with my allowance either or anything like that. You know, I probably spent it on lottery tickets. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because uh, that's all that I can think of. So you are, were starting to negotiate early and you had the scarcity mentality. Mm -hmm. Did you start working for other people earlier than others then? I had a lemonade stand or like I okay, had yeah. a bake sale all the time. And then for actual job jobs, though, I think my first ones were at 13. I had like a paper route delivering flyers 13, twice yeah. a week. And then by 14 and 15, I was. Yeah, working part time in like retail stores. Uh, would you be willing to talk about your parents' situation, or do you want to skip over that? Uh no, I I can I can discuss that, no problem. So, like, what was the household income uh, made of, and why why was it always very tight? So both my parents were like they didn't get high educational attainment. Like neither of them actually finished high school, which was a lot more common back then. This was like late sure, 70s and yeah. the 80s. So it wasn't quite like what it is now. So neither of them got their high school diploma, which wasn't a big deal at the time. But it definitely meant that we would always have like the household income that was below that. They yeah. divorced when I was nine, which also obviously caused a lot of financial stress on the family. And yeah. I remember like both my parents have only ever worked for hourly wages their like their whole lives and including when we were children. So f I have no idea what our household income would be in a gross sense. I knew like my mom for a long time um, worked in retail. So that was probably minimum wage, maybe a little bit, maybe a few dollars over per hour because she'd been working there for so long. And my dad was just a general contractor. He did a lot of like uh, building houses. So his income was a little better, but it was very seasonal, right? So he would make most of yeah. his money in the spring and summer. And then in the winter, I mean, if it was 40 below, which it often got in Edmonton where we lived, <laughs> uh, he wouldn't go to work. And so you wouldn't earn money that day. So it was like a combination of really all the worst factors. It was sure. divorce, low educational attainment, hourly wages, and seasonal work like it at, like, I mean I've never actually said it all out loud this is the first time oh, I've like put it all together and I'm like holy cow like there's just basically no option for success that's it well that that's what I'm hearing right is that there there's really like they would be able to make money but there's no growth going on right there, right yeah so and they there was three kids there was me and my two younger sisters so it wasn't like um, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Like there's a lot of mouths to feed. There's a lot of kids to clothe. There's school trips and things like that. And so there was just nothing left over at the end. There was like no savings. I don't think my parents ever went like terribly into debt. I think there was some debt, but I would consider it minor now, like, but I have a different perspective of income. But I think just because their incomes were so low and inconsistent, they didn't have access to huge amounts of credit. So they actually couldn't get into a lot of trouble that way. Like we weren't drowning in debt, but we definitely would just run out of money all the, the time. Silver lining there. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because yeah. I, I always admire people who especially were living paycheck to paycheck and didn't turn to credit because, as you know, one uh, incident and you got to get a pay loan, you know, like... It happens, right? Yeah. And I don't know why my parents never got into that. Or if they did, I have no idea about it. Like, I don't yeah. think that they did because I think it would have ultimately, like, come out at some point. But I honestly think um, just their incomes would have kept them out from accessing credit. And so it didn't happen. And I don't – I've never heard them talk about payday loans. I think it just wasn't something – uh, we considered. Not. I think like worst case scenarios, they probably sometimes borrowed money from like my grandparents. But sure. um, I mean, those are family loans. I, they're like no interest, maybe never have to pay back kind of thing. So I don't think there was any trouble with debt. We just we just had no money. Did this aversion to credit or, or not not access to credit? Did that carry forward to you or, or did you have the opposite? Did you just get credit cards whenever you could? Well, I didn't even like think about credit or credit cards probably yeah. until I was like in my 20s. I got student loans before I got credit cards. Of course, of course. And I don't have an aversion to credit. 
I have a very <laughs> like lackadaisical re- approach to very it. Healthy relationship. Now, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's entirely true, but um, <laughs> I certainly like leverage when I have the opportunity. I mean, I guess I, I'm thinking of it in a different context. Like, I'll borrow to invest or borrow to start a business, but I don't yes. like. I've never had to borrow to meet my basic needs, so that's a different thing. But I mean, obviously, I'm self-employed, so I definitely see highs and lows in my income. And I do think about it sometimes that I have access to like large lines of credit at low interest rates that if I need to carry myself for a month or two, it's practically inconsequential. Like my lifestyle doesn't change and there's no real stress. So it, it is a different situation than my parents had but yeah i mean borrowing for income smoothing is very different <laughs> than borrowing to pay like the hydro bill because yeah. you can't afford it right it, which it, you know is, that's an unfortunate situation you're just you know like you said uh, a, a business is a very different situation i i am like a- i'm usually anti debt except for business because i know business needs capital to grow and you can't always use the capital that you have because one who has capital to start right exactly Usually. yeah <laughs> yeah i don't mind debt for that reason if there's a purpose and and you're obviously educated in how to use debt so that's yeah well it's good it's good that you got that education but we'll go back we'll go back to student loans but first uh, we'll go back to you making money for yourself so that you could well, I guess buy things that you wanted to, right? Is that the main reason why you would, would have been working? I have no idea because, like, when I think back, I can't think of anything that I really wanted. I think I just, really? yeah. I mean, this is a lot of things like I'm unpacking <laughs> now in my adulthood <laughs> that I just yeah. always have a complex that there's not enough money and it doesn't matter mm. how much there is and there's nothing I need to buy with it because I have a very comfortable life, but I never, like, I never feel like there's enough and I think that was true when I was a child because I can't think of any toy or anything that I wanted I know for a long time I really wanted a computer because of course I did and I remember like writing out on a page of loose leaf paper like my weekly allowance to save up for this like computer from Best Buy (laughs) I don't know and I was calculating the interest like if I put it in a savings account by hand I was calculating the interest (laughs) and I just remember like it was going to take me like four and a half years or something and I was just yeah devastated and I was like I can't like I can't do this I have there has to be a better way and so I was always like looking for extra ways to make money yeah so yeah you really had it from the beginning do you remember then saving up money Um, oh no I never I don't save at all I I save (laughs) now and it's like only because I force it to happen and I basically consider it spending but no I didn't have any good savings habits it never occurred to me to save money and I think because my parents weren't saving and this wasn't something that they passed on like I never thought of money as something that you saved like that it just didn't make sense to me money was something you got so that you could spend it and you got more money so you could spend more of it I never like (laughs) understood saving until I found personal finance blogs when I was like 23 it never yeah I never I didn't save a dime I, I had nothing to show for it it's such an interesting situation right because like if you don't if you're not talking about saving then you're not going to talk about investing for right sure right like that's never going to come up because you gotta sort of it's like usually spending saving investing is the yeah the trajectory there so and yeah i know you got into that later so you decide you want to go to school for something and what was that so actually what happened is i was working for whatever six dollars an hour i I think i was like waiting tables and you got like six dollars okay. an hour plus your tips And it finally occurred to me that if I didn't do something different, like this is what my life would be. And I would be like (laughs) just getting paid enough to pay rent and put gas in my car. And that was it. Like my parents, right? Like my parents, like that, that was it. And I just, I remember having a moment where I'm just like, oh shit, I can't do this. And that's when I was like, okay, what is like the highest earning career that I can get out of school? <laughs> and okay. yeah, like the conversation we were having earlier, it would, I thought that I wanted to be a doctor because that just seemed like yeah. you get paid a lot of money, people respect you and it would be, it would be nice. So and you're helping them. Yeah, right. And you help people. That's also an important part of medicine. You can see why <laughs> I didn't pursue that career. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so I enrolled in science in undergrad. I did pretty well considering. Yeah, now it shocks me that I don't even know how I did how I did as well as I did because I had that financial stress the whole way through. I mean, I didn't yeah. live at home. I had to take out student loans and I had to work through every year like and all the time not just in the summers like all i was working 20 hours a week yeah. through school all the time and that's with like a full five course course load plus labs in science and i still ended up graduating with honors like i think my gpa was like a 3.84 or something which was wow, wild okay. i took the mcat and i did really well and then okay. i i applied to medical school and i didn't um so i only applied to one i only applied to my the school i did my undergrad at which was the university of alberta and i didn't yeah. get an interview and i remember just being livid because i had had the same gpa and the same mcat score as one of my friends and he had gotten an interview and he actually got in and he's now a psychiatrist of all things. Oh, but wow. <laughs> but I remember I couldn't believe that he had gotten an interview and I hadn't and I hadn't applied to any other schools. So I had no other options. And I remember like going and trying to find out. I'm like, why didn't I get oh, this? Yeah. And what had been lacking was like my volunteer experience uh, yes, and extracurricular activities. And I... I'm like, even now it just upsets me because like I did have some, I was like president of the chemistry students association and sure. Yeah. Actually that was it. Cause that was the only thing I could okay. <laughs> fit. Everything else. Yeah. Was well you paid. had other things to do. Yeah. Yeah. And I like, I had been waiting tables 20 hours a week for four years straight. I was like a nanny. Like I had all these paid jobs that I had to do to like keep a roof over my head and eat and as a result, like all my extracurriculars were obviously lacking. And I don't really have any criticism for the school because this isn't even a unique story. And I know they get like literally thousands of qualified applicants. I'm sure they just like randomly pick names out of a hat at this point. But <laughs> yeah. And so I ended up then enrolling in graduate school um, in science with the idea that I was going to reapply. Um, oh, really? <laughs> But then I never, wow. yeah, so I have half of a master's degree in molecular genetics. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Believe it or not, I had the intention to reapply, but I actually, I never, I never did. <laughs> I never, I never tried for medicine ever again. <laughs> well, just to comment on the extracurriculars, it feels like such a privileged thing to, to be able to, to expect people to just have all of these extracurriculars that aren't paid work because they, what, have all the money in the world to pay for school. Yeah. Uh, it, it just right. Isn't, doesn't it seem a little unfair to not it, consider it is. That, and that like you my, were... Yeah. And like my friend that did like, actually lots of my friends got into medical school and some didn't get in the first round, but they did try again. And some got in the second round. And I mean, all of them were from um, more affluent families. Like even yeah. this friend that I saw as my direct competitor, cause our scores and our academics were almost identical like I remember his parents like bought him a condo near the university on, so right? he could live <laughs> and go to school and he volunteered for the Red Cross and he did all these international travel like humanitarian missions and like this is nothing against him he's a wonderful person he's a wonderful doctor and he's a very like brilliant guy but it was yeah, it was it was hard to watch like my more affluent friends have these legs up. And I think that's one of the points in my life where it really became obvious of what financial privilege is and how it yes. can work for you. And now it it changes my perspective as a mother with my child. And I like I look like my baby's only two and I look at her sometimes and I'm just like, oh, my God, like the financial advantages you have already already are, yeah like it's so crazy, extraordinary right? i just hope she becomes aware of it when she's in her 20s <laughs> oh i i think you'll help with that yeah i didn't have them and my life is certainly different because of it like it's not bad i think i i think i ended up in a better place but yeah that was probably yeah my mid-20s i would have been 24 i think and that was probably like one of the more heartbreaking moments where i realized Oh, some things are easier for other people. Yeah, and and again, why didn't you uh, reapply? Did you just you lost you lost uh, faith? <laughs> I, I did. I was like, I was so angry. 
<laughs> oh yeah. Oh, n- understandable. Yeah. Yeah, I was, and at that point, I was like burning out financially. Right, I had just done a four-year mm. undergrad. I was now like an underpaid graduate student. I had over twenty thousand dollars of student loans. I was, yeah, twenty. I guess I was turning twenty-five. I was kind of feeling like um, my life is never going to get going if I do another med school application cycle. I won't graduate till I'm twenty-nine, and then I'll do residency. And where am I going to fit kids? And I was having all those anxieties that (laughs) women have because women have to plan their whole life in the context of their fertility and when it will be least disruptive to their career. So yeah, it's, it's so like easy for guys, right? Like we don't (laughs) have to think about that at all. There's no timeline. You're just like, the time will come at some point and it will be right. And so we'll do it (laughs) then. But yeah, I I was, I was like a very practical, I like to plan. I'm very like organized and I was like doing the math and I'm like, this is not going to work out. And same, like, again, to our earlier conversation, which I don't know if you recorded that because we were just talking casually. Yeah, no, I, pro- I probably won't play it, but so so you can repeat that. Uh, yeah, but I had learned actually more about medicine, and it, I realized like it's a high stress, not so glamorous jobs. Like actually, some of my friends are physicians, and they let me like come to work with them and shadow them, and it was the first time I realized that I'm like oh, being a doctor means going to a clinic or a hospital for eight hours a day where you're working with people who are not at their best, like patients are stressed, they're sick. Sometimes you have to tell them that they're going to die. Like it was, it was so strange to me where I hadn't considered all the aspects of this profession. I was only looking at like the paycheck and the prestige. But the reality of it, yeah. Yeah, the reality of it was, I was like, will I really be happy coming in 40, 50 hours a week in a job that you really have to be so mentally and emotionally strong, like you really have to earn that paycheck. And when I looked at it in that context, I thought I'm like, I don't, I don't know if I'll actually excel in this profession. I don't know if it's what I really want to do. I think I need something a little more dynamic and less, I mean, a different kind of stress. I want to say less stressful, but I don't think I chose a less stressful path. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a big decision to pivot. So, yeah, where, what was your first move out of, uh, out of, I guess, did you, did, you didn't finish your master's, you said? I didn't, no. So I had like a, then a breakdown in like graduate school and I, I dropped out in the middle of my degree, like Again, on good terms, I think I left with a 4.0 GPA, which is wild. And like on my transcript, it just says like student withdrew because they wanted to or whatever. I just quit and I didn't have a backup plan. I didn't have like anything in the wings. It was just like, I don't know. I just had one of those moments where you get so fed fed up with your life and you're like, fuck it. And you just bail. And I remember I had um, my personal finance blog at the time. I don't even know if it was called Money After Graduation yet. I think it was just under my name. Yeah. Or I was at least blogging. I don't know if it was finance yet, but I was blogging. And I remember I dropped out of grad school and I bought a ticket to France. I just (laughs) left. And oh, no, it must have been personal finance because other personal finance bloggers like Crystal Yee and people, they were like, what are you doing? And like everyone was kind of (laughs) trying to be like really polite, like you're going through a hard time, but maybe you shouldn't take like a $7,000 trip to Paris. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah. And I was just like, fuck it. And I took off for, I think, like almost five weeks, quite a quite a time. And I rented this Airbnb in Paris. And I just lived in France for a month until I felt better. (laughs) Okay. Well, I mean, that's some kind of therapy. I was thinking a $600 round trip uh, weekend, but wow, that's, uh, so did you feel better? I did feel better because (laughs) I channeled all my intense, like type A driven, ambitious characteristics the same way like I did in undergrad into like a productive way in France. So I I really just like sat in my Airbnb or I went out to this coffee shop all the time. And I like just filled this book with like goals and plans. And a lot of them were financial, actually. And yeah. I just like I made a list and I was like, Kate, this is what I'm doing when I get back. <laughs> That's what happened. Well, it sounds like an in- it was an investment. Like a lot of productivity comes from taking breaks. Totally. And that, this sounds like it was pro- maybe one of the most important things for you to do at that time. You never know it at the time that you're going through like one of the most in- 
defining moments of your life, but it, it yeah. truly was. So you come back from France. Yeah. Uh, are you Calgary or Edmonton at this point? I'm still in Edmonton. And so Edmonton, now what, what in the book? Uh, what, is there a first move in the book? Yeah. So in the book, I like... I still wanted to get a six figure job. I decided I wanted to study business. So an MBA was in the book, but I couldn't go right into an MBA program. I needed like two years of professional work experience, which I didn't have. Like I'd been a grad student oh, wow. and then yeah. I was a nanny. And so I'm like, okay, I need to get at least two years um, of professional work experience. So I'll just do that. And I actually got a job at the university because I can't leave the University of Alberta campus. I have like a disorder <laughs> that I always need to be close to it. Even now yeah. I'm like back in Edmonton and I'm, I go there all the time. I freaking love the U of A. <laughs> Got a job for the faculty of engineering at the University of Alberta. And I started like really attacking my student loans. And that's what I was blogging about. So I was literally just there. I'm like, I'm get, I'm here for two years. I'm getting my work experience and then I'm going to get an MBA. And they were like, okay, that sounds fine. <laughs> what did you do there? I worked in recruitment. So my role i also managed like the first year so i was like a first year academic advisor sort of even though the curriculum in engineering is fixed so i didn't do a lot of advising it was also <laughs> trying to tell students not awesome. to drop out and yeah, then yeah, you can stick with it right engineering is tough to yeah stick with. I, and I, then I... I was i was mostly focused on trying to increase female enrollment in engineering so i did a lot nice. of high school and junior high visits to try to encourage young women to study engineering and it went really well That's like we increased cool. yeah. female enrollment by like 30 percent in the time that i was there so That's i was huge. really proud of that yeah they the, everyone is really sweet like we all cried when i left but i had to go <laughs> Well, that's an awesome impact for what you were saying. It's just like, I'm just going to do the what I need to do and then go. But you actually made a difference. So that's nice. Yeah. Yeah, it was awesome. Very cool. And so you did you did that exactly what you intended to do. <laughs> yeah, I you did. did that, and then you went an MBA full time. Yeah, I went full time into the MBA. So that those two years were really good. Like when I was working at the Faculty of Engineering, I was making like $50,000 a year. And then I had full health benefits and a pension on top of that. And I think like the rent I was paying was only like $700 a month. So I just killed it. Like I wiped out my student loan balance. I started investing in the stock market. I was like super set up. And then I went back to school to do um, my MBA full time. I looked at a bunch of schools across Canada. I applied to a bunch. I was really lucky I got in everywhere because of my GMAT score and obviously my undergraduate academics that were designed for medical school. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so I was excited accepted everywhere, but I ultimately just decided to go to Calgary because it was the cheapest. MBAs in Alberta are like extraordinarily cheap. It's wonderful. Okay. So, well, comparatively, right? Like my tuition was yeah. only about $25,000 a year at the University of Calgary. Now it's more <laughs> like they've raised it, I think, to like $30,000 a year. But I mean, it's a two-year program. So to be in and out for that, it was worth it for me. So yeah, I moved to Calgary and I did my MBA full time. Okay, so let's step back and talk about the, the debt then before you started paying it off. So mm -hmm. you had how much from school uh, had, when, you, when you were done? Just under 21,000. I had like 20,500 something. And what about the seven grand to go to, the, to France? Oh my God, I just like spent that. That wasn't even, that was like a like, combination of work and savings. Like that's money you had in the bank. Yeah, I think I came back like owing two or three thousand dollars, but I paid it okay. off so fast because you have to remember I always had like four jobs at a time. <laughs> yeah, so you're were so you, you, the student loans were like an isolated you know chunk of of debt, and then you're pretty much keeping up with like you add money in the bank and maybe a, a little a couple of months of credit cards. Yeah. Here, so because when you're when you're a graduate student, you're paid. You don't have to pay yeah. to go to graduate school in science. So you actually receive That's a nice. stipend. It's not very much. It's like twenty five thousand dollars a year, but it's like two grand a month to go to school. And then I also worked on top of that, which my like um, PI hated. He, <laughs> he like, of course, cause I was not dedicated to our research at all. So I, th I think I was like, 
I don't know. I was doing odd jobs. I think I might have. Oh, I was working at the Apple store. That's where I was. Okay. So I was working at the Apple store like two evenings a weekend on Saturdays while I was in grad school for science. So I think like my income was probably $3,000 a month. That's awesome. And my student loans weren't in repayment when I was in grad student because technically I was still a student, right? So is this Alberta provincial loans? How, how, what did it's you Alberta provincial and the Canadian student loans. Yeah. So and, and you were able to qualify because your parents were lower income. You got you got as much as you could get from the government. Yeah. Yeah. Any grants or anything? I got a few like academic scholarships, and I think I got like a low income grant. Oh, I can't. You think that you won't forget when someone gives you thousands know, of dollars, I but know. when it's like <laughs> ten or fifteen years ago, I have no idea. Like, I don't, maybe you've you've looked into this recently. Twenty grand is is that like an average uh, to come out of school, like an undergrad? Uh, for Canadians. It was at the time. Like you have to yeah. remember this was a graduation in 2010. So this okay. is almost yeah. a decade ago. Yeah, and yeah. So at the time I had like the average student debt, like now it's much higher. It is, eh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's a uh, what's a typical uh, uh tuition these days? Is it up in the eights or Yeah, I would say, I think like it's that? like 8,000 something. I think it's like 8200 a year at yeah, the U, so, of, uh, U of A, which is the one I check cuz that's where my daughter has so, to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're already RESPing, I, I imagine. Oh yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I saw tw tweets about that. Yeah, I guess anybody can go and follow you money after graduation on Twitter or, and and uh, what do you recommend people follow your personal uh, account or If they want. I mean, it's not financial. <laughs> my personal account is just me like parenting and dating. So if you're interested in that, then you can follow Bridgie Casey. There's a few financial things in there, unless I uh, uh, seeing them on the money after graduation. Um, uh, they might, I may, Twitter they might keep, come across both. I mean, it's just life, right? <laughs> yeah, but it's good. Like, I, you know, you're you're very open about your life and and uh, open to to discussion about things, which you know, not everybody is. And uh, hopefully, you know, people. I, I think this that kind of discussion helps others, right? You know, like if you're talking about like how much should I put in uh, or what kind of resp or you know should oh I yeah do, i do or, talk yeah know. i do tweet about that all the time because i have so much anxiety over my daughter's education fund <laughs> one of the ones i liked was um the well the crazy amount uh that is in the states right it's like if we're going to be saving what does somebody say a million dollars or something like that or two hundred. well no 000? someone was like i'm gonna save four hundred thousand dollars because yeah. if my kids want to go to harvard they can go and i was like I'm going to disown my child if she thinks I'm going to pay for that. I'll be like, I'll well, 400,000. Like you can live on, on that. And that's, that's what other people were pointing out. Like people were chiming in and saying like, you know, they would get like an income of whatever, sixteen, eighteen hundred dollars a month <laughs> right. for the rest of their lives for that. Yeah. Sum. Like really you want to spend it on Harvard? Yeah. So or just, just set it up as a fund, uh, like a trust fund that, that, that the, the principal never goes and, Hey, here's a yeah. little bit of money to start you off with your life. Now work to get to pay for the rest of school. Exactly. School you can yeah. Afford, we, et cetera, et cetera. Right. That's a very American thing, though, to go oh. at, for college education at any cost. Like even like, I mean, obviously, we're now talking about later aspects of my life. I don't know if you want this conversation to go in a more chronological oh, we're order. all over the place. It's all good. We'll, I'll come back. But yeah, because like I, I'm not sure yet if I want my daughter to go to university. I'll have a lot of money set aside for her and yeah, it will be there. But I can't predict right now if that will be the right choice because she's two. And so we're thinking 16 years away, like what, yeah. what will be the most profitable career then? What will be the best use of your time and money? I'm not going to say that it's whatever a science or engineering degree at a certain school because that might not be true no how can you how can you possibly know and and uh what what is the because you've probably done some more research than i have on this uh with a six-month <laughs> baby what is the risk you, you have to give back the canada education savings grant part of uh of the resp is that right yeah so if the resp goes unused well you can collapse the resp is what what it's called you can withdraw up to yeah. fifty thousand tax-free to your rrsp um, okay, yeah. so you can transfer that. So it could end up as part of my retirement savings. You have to return sure. all the grants to the government and then all the gains and any interest dividends and so on are, are going to be taxed at the rate of whoever withdraws it. So either you can withdraw okay. it as I think I'm the subscriber cause I set it up and then she would be the beneficiary. Sure, yeah. She's the beneficiary. So, yeah. yeah. So whoever takes it out, it's taxed at 
their uh, tax level. But you do like you do have to really seriously consider it because you're yeah yeah because that money is more powerful in a TFSA. So do we really want to, like you have to make choices, which I think a lot of people don't. They just want to do the best for their kid, and I mean the best for your kid might not be giving them two hundred thousand dollars for university. <laughs> Well, yeah, and, and I mean, do you think that the, I mean, given those restrictions and that you would have to collapse it after a certain time and pay tax on, on any of the, the gains, that you can't transfer and give back uh, the, the Canada Education Savings Grant, which is what, $7,200? Uh, yeah, $7,200, like yeah. Is it worth it? Is it uh, the $7,200 worth it to go through all that pain if your kid doesn't go to school? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because it, yeah, yeah. Cause it's totally free money. And like when it's, it's free the... Money. The RESP is really good if you set it up through like a financial institution and not a group RESP. Yes. So <laughs> if you set it up Agreed. in a, le a legitimate way, it can be used for any kind of post-secondary education. So that also includes trade schools and colleges. Like they don't have to get a four-year university degree. If That's they want right. to become like an apprentice, carpenter, tradesperson of so like they can use it towards that. So it's important not to forget that. Like, so I think even yeah. some like aesthetic schools will count. Like, so if your sure. daughter wants to be a hairstylist or your son wants to be a hairstylist, they could use their RESP for that. So there's no harm in having some for your children, as long as it's not to the detriment of your own financial security. Yeah. Like what are the chances they're not going to uh, want some kind of education, right? Like I, most things need something right and your kid is probably like mostly kids are like their parents at the end of the day and i mean i have a graduate degree my baby's father has an undergrad degree in engineering and so like everybody goes to university she's probably going to get the same or more educational attainment than us because that's just how <laughs> that's how the world works right <laughs> Well, then also, if she knows she has the money set aside for it, what do you think? Do you think it might propel her to do it more or she just might be like, do you think she might feel like forced? I haven't thought that far ahead. Like also, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the other thing to note is both her dad and I are entrepreneurs. Both of us work for ourselves. We both run companies that we own. So mm. I honestly wouldn't be surprised if she was like, screw university, I'd rather try my hand at like starting a business and to be honest i'll give her the money to do that like that's fine by me if yeah that's what she wants to do and at that point paying tax on on gains that uh, are not used is not a huge deal if you are you have a plan for right you know, yeah future, like right you can't spend your whole life agonizing over pennies right <laughs> <laughs> and that's a, that's what a lot of people do, right? It's like, oh, should I put it, uh, you know, in here or in there? Well, I, let's just get started. Let's just yeah. put it somewhere, right? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> and, uh, exactly. Right, like that's that's the more important thing is like, well, or or you know, as as you might say, figure out how to make money, and then then we can deal with where to put it afterwards. Like, let's not talk about where to invest money you don't have. Right, yet, exactly. You're not even earning it. Yeah, that's the tough thing, right? It's like we're, we're telling everyone, uh, you know, invest in ETFs and stuff, and and I think uh, the conversation at the same time needs to be uh, talking more about the side hustles and uh, how to get a job that pays for your student loans or not get into student loans and work first, all those kind of conversations, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's more it's more relevant. So, okay, so uh, back to you. You're, okay, you said learning, uh, uh, you're putting money in the stock market. So yeah. what, where are you learning about this um, um, when you're you know fully in the science world? <laughs> Did you have a side uh, hobby of, of uh, looking at the Globe and Mail uh, financial no, section well, or no? When I was like, I would like Google because I realized this was like in my last year of my undergrad degree and I saw my yeah. like student loan balance looming. I had zero in savings and I was like, oh man, this is awful. And obviously I still had that thing where I, in, in my mind where I'm like, I can't be poor. I need to have money or I'll never be happy. Always and then there. I'm like, yeah. what do rich people do? <laughs> and rich people invest in the stock market. And I okay. remember like telling this to my um bo college boyfriend at the time and he was like you have to have like fifty thousand dollars to get started in the stock market like you can't invest and it was dumb because i like believed him for a few months but then after <laughs> we broke up i was like oh my god this isn't true and i think i was just reading like money sense magazine and yeah, yeah the globe and mail and i was like okay yeah i'm gonna do this and i just started investing and this was like before etfs like 
ETFs weren't even a thing, really. So I was just for robos. Oh, long no, before robo robos. Advisors, yeah. Right? Yeah. So what did you what did you do? It was me like researching stocks, like learning um, all the metrics of stocks and stuff like okay. I was learning P.E. ratios. I was understanding dividend dates. I was doing all the like debt to income and debt to asset calculations. Like I was I was deep in it because it was a lot of money for me. Like I wasn't buying less than a thousand dollars of a stock at a time. And it took me like a while to come up with that thousand dollars. So I was like very serious with what I chose to invest in. Well, yeah. And th this is pre MBA, right? This is pre MBA. So good prep for your uh, finance section. <laughs> it yeah, it was useful. <laughs> Those are the only classes I didn't really have to study yeah. for. <laughs> ratios i never like ratios but if it's relevant to you like if you can know what the ratios mean and they actually mean something to you that that makes it way easier for you to to excel so so you you're like value investing basically pretty much yeah i was reading a lot of like benjamin graham and yeah, yeah. i was i was deep into that okay and so like uh, how much were you able to like you paid off your debt and then how much were you able to get like uh, invested, if you don't mind talking about that before you took your MBA? I think I had about $20,000 at wow. that point. Yeah. Like when you think of it, I mean, now that doesn't sound like a lot of money, but when you think like I paid off 21,000 and then also yeah. amassed that at the same time, it was huge. That's great. Yeah. It was, so it was a lot. So I had about that, but you have to remember, like I didn't do all the work and I do like point this out very clearly. Like the stock market has only gone up for the past 10 years. Like <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. been virtually impossible to lose money. I mean, I've managed to do it a few times, but it's not common. So I, I did luck out as when I started investing. Like I think I opened my Quest Trade account, I kid you not, November, 2009. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Like I wow. timed the bottom. I like got in of, like yeah, bargain basement prices on everything. And I had no idea about the stock market, so I didn't even know that it was like at the bottom, basically. So like, you could have bought had... anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I did. And I and I profited wildly for the next ten years, basically, is what happened. That's that's really great. And are you still uh, a value investor now, or have you simplified? No, I've almost gone entirely to ETFs now. I yeah. I rarely choose stocks. Like I have a few that I've just held on for eternity, like Pepsi or McDonald's. But okay, um, yeah, sure. <laughs> the rest of the time, I yeah, I I shovel everything into like three or four ETFs, and I never. I never deviate or move from that. They're all on drips and it just it just grows without me looking at it. Before uh, robos, I hated to pay brokerage fees and I saw yeah. how to buy stocks directly from the companies with share purchase plans and, and, and yeah. dividend reinvestment plans, as you said. And but you couldn't hold them in retirement accounts. Yeah, I know. <laughs> right? That's so you're paying tax on these and it was it was banks mostly. Uh, I think I, I I mean, I have one share of each of them now because I had to buy one share to be, become a shareholder. And I can't <laughs> get rid of those shares because I have the certificates and I apparently have to go and send them the certificates. Oh, oh, yeah, you do. do yeah, you have to do oh, it like God. it's the 80s. <laughs> yeah, seriously. For these, like even the digital ones, like I have to go through some kind of weird thing. So I have one share still of these, like I like two banks and, and uh, an en two energy companies. Like... <laughs> So, but like that, it's a good education, but also, yeah, like these are, they pay dividends and they are reinvested and they just grow. Yeah. I remember like, learning about dividends and I couldn't believe you got money for nothing. It was just, right? it blew my mind. And then, and then I they was take like, them and they, they buy more of the stuff for you automatically. Yeah. And then, oh man, <laughs> what's it, that, that about? That changed right? my life. I know. Yeah. It changed my <laughs> life. <laughs> so, I mean, of course the, this happens within funds now we just don't see it uh, right. like as explicitly as as like here are some dividends uh you know here's a check or or you know some more stuff right yeah um so we we're ex we're all experiencing this if we have ETFs or 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 mutual funds or index funds but it's just not as fun <laughs> right <laughs> but still it's like it's exciting when you get money for nothing and, yeah and exactly once when someone explains to you the concept for the first time it's like you buy this thing and then someone pays you to to hold on to it it's forever it's kind of ma magical and often stuff. they increase the amount they pay you like every so yeah. often they're like oh we're increasing the dividend and you're like cool i got a raise for doing nothing like yeah like <laughs> 
I I had to work hard at a job to get a raise, you know? It's like, or <laughs> yeah. like I'd say hard. And they're like, like, oh, we're increasing you know, this hard. 15%. And you're like, cool, great, thanks. Awesome. You know, I mean, I didn't ask, but good. You just kind of learned, you got into it because you wanted to just, you always had this anti-poverty uh, thing. Yeah. Uh, build wealth and this, the stock market was the way. And uh, then you got lucky that you didn't you didn't take any risk you were educated so you educated yourself but also you came in at the bottom of the market yeah and it's been like skyrocketed i think yeah i think mean, my well simple accounts my etfs there i think that overall since uh they've gone up like 20 percent like that's wild we don't know what it's like to live in a bad no market. we have no idea no and it's if people are gonna I mean, I, we try to prepare everybody, right? Like, <laughs> hey, 40-year 40 40 outlook, it's going to go down and up and down. But no, still, people are going to... Well, we say that. Do you believe... I don't, I don't even know. I say those things, but I'm like, what will I actually feel like in it? I have no idea. That's a good point. Like, Because we're, we're very much aware of what is going to happen. What we're supposed to do is buy more of the thing, right? Yeah. When it's when it's on sale, <laughs> why wouldn't why wouldn't we? I, yeah. I, like, and that's what that's another good reason to not invest money that you need for anything. Right. And and I guess like, how do you feel about like, are you investing always for the long term, or do you have short term investments? Well, now I I'm almost always investing for the long term. Like I said, I had to for me to save and invest. I actually have to think of it as money I've spent. Like, I know that I have it, but it yeah. doesn't like oh, I don't gone. process yeah. it as money that is actually useful to me. It's like it's gone as far as I'm concerned. It, it yep. just grows as numbers on a sheet that are meaningless but numbers, yes. yeah. <laughs> so everything is really for the long term i mean the only short-term investments i ever make are really in my businesses and that's where all my risk is which is another reason why i switched most of my investment portfolio to etfs because i made the decision i'm going to take all my financial risks as an entrepreneur and i'm not going to take risks in my portfolio because i need it to be there when my business plans don't work out yeah no that's that's really smart yeah and and, and of course that's something you can control like that's essentially what warren buffett uh did early on is he would go and sit in the business and, mm -hmm. and you can you can affect the direction of the business it's a etfs are passive on our part and all funds are passive for us even though they're managed by somebody else right we don't really have a say right exactly and in your business, you do. And so the, the, the more risk in that situation makes more sense to me, right? Yeah. Okay, so now we're at your MBA. Mm -hmm. Get your MBA. Where'd the 50 grand come from? Or it was a 50 grand? Uh, yeah, that's what it cost. I think on paper, I got a scholarship like right out of the gate. I think like a big nice. one. I think it was like $10,000 or something for... Whew. Okay. entrepreneurship <laughs> yeah, that's great. which is so funny because i didn't think i was an entrepreneur at the time <laughs> and at this point money after graduation was probably generating like not a ton but like fifteen hundred dollars a month enough for me to at least live on and then i applied for student loans but because i they saw my income for the past two years <laughs> They like they wouldn't give me anything. Like I think for my first year, oh. they're like, "Here's seven thousand dollars," and I was like, well, yeah. "What am I gonna do with this?" <laughs> like it okay. was so, so bad. So the next year, though. Yeah, the next year, I think I got a little more. You think I would know all these? I feel like motherhood just wrecked my brain. Oh I think yeah, it was no, like tell twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> I can't remember, but in the second year, I was working full time because my classes were at night. So I actually oh, okay. went to work for a startup incubator. I was there like eight to four, and then I would go to class from five to nine, and then I would oh, run money God. after graduation on the weekend. <laughs> yeah. So, and the startup incubator was paying me like pretty well because I had half an MBA. So I think I was making like $70,000 a year. They started me out at money after Amazing. graduation was still trucking along at like $2,000 a month, $2,500 a month. So I was making over a hundred thousand dollars in my second year of my While MBA. taking an MBA. Well, that's pretty uh, awesome. I don't think <laughs> other people have that yeah. option. Uh, so, okay. So you're, you're doing okay. And, uh, and this is just because uh, just to, to me, it just seems like you're willing to work, right? I that, like that, work all is that the, the time. Secret? It's like a neurotic <laughs> tick for me. Like 
it never seems abnormal until I tell someone, like, even when I just said it out loud to you, like, I'm like, did I really work eight to four and then go to class <laughs> five to nine and then work on the weekends again? Like, it sounds obscene, but it never, like, it is what I like to do. It even becomes not about the money. It's just genuinely how I like to spend my time. So yeah, I do work constantly. And I do think if you work constantly for money, you, uh, Mass a lot of money eventually. That's a, it. Really, is some kind of crazy secret, right? Like, <laughs> how do how do we make you just work a lot? I know, you and just work all the time. So. That's it. Well, I mean, but you have to have things uh, that people want, and you know, you add skills, and and uh, you know, I mean, also YouTube videos uh, were an early thing for you, right? Yeah, that's probably when I started them. I think either when I was in my second year of the MBA or just when I finished. And and I know they take a lot of work. Like I, it's yeah, not YouTube's easy super to make annoying. a video. Yeah. Yeah. So like that's time too. And the, the the payoff is not instant, but you would get a, do you make money off YouTube now or do you get traffic? I do. Yeah. And I yeah. haven't, I've only posted one video in like the past 12 months. I'm actually going to film some tomorrow, but no, YouTube has ended up being like a weirdly very profitable thing for me. I just haven't invested in it more because of lack of time. And yeah, it takes, takes time to do it. It takes but... time. And it's like a very personal medium. Like you, you make bank as a YouTuber, but you do have to share quite a bit of your personal life. And that's, that, that's harder for me. That's it. Eh? And so, and then you would have started working with, uh, with brands a little bit along mm -hmm. the way too. Yeah. Yeah. So just wherever the opportunities uh, um, came up. Right. Yeah. And uh, and hiring staff, like, did you have staff or was it all you writing? It was uh, all me. So this is like kind of when things started to go to hell. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, yeah. I don't know how yeah. much so time you're doing we have everything. to talk. <laughs> you know, well, uh, you know um, it depends so much time you have. Uh, probably another five minutes. We can we can. Start no, with... I have. I just like we're actually getting to like the good stuff and we're not going to be able to fit <laughs> it in. Um, yes. So this is what happened then. I graduated from my MBA. Six yeah. months later, I quit that really nice like $75,000 a year job that I had. And I was like, yeah. I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I had gotten married. Then my husband didn't really like that I worked all the time. He kind of, I think he thought that when I was done um, my MBA and I quit like the startup incubator that I would only be doing one job. So I would be free <laughs> more. Uh. turns out I'm not that kind of person. I do just work. <laughs> yeah, that eight to yeah, nine PM yeah. every day, um, seven days a week. So then I ended up also getting divorced. <laughs> okay. For and that, that was reason. Yeah. Is yeah. It, was it a time just, the uh, miscommunication of like how you're going to be when you were done with this? Yeah. It was just a disagreement over the kind of lifestyles yeah, we want, okay. like, um, yeah. without going into too much detail of it. Cause obviously I don't want to speak for him and his experience, but no, of course, I can imagine that it was kind of a bummer to get married to this person that you love and thinking you're going to get to spend all this time with them is because they're finally done school. They're finally like getting their business off the ground. And then it turns out they're still not really there and they're not, they're not really present, I guess, because their energy is always on their business. So I think that really sucked for him and I feel bad about it, but this is the person I am. And I know that now. <laughs> Well, yeah, and it, and it's expectations, right? Like, and then maybe, yeah, and maybe you didn't even know at the time either. Right, right? I had never known student. not yeah. being a student and having a side hustle. And then yeah, it was also yeah, like the risks of entrepreneurship. Like you have to really have uh, the guts to yeah. do it. And yeah. what had happened is, so I was in my second year of my MBA, I was making whatever, like between all my jobs, maybe 110, 100, between 110 and $130,000, like not a small amount of money. My ex-husband was also making good money, not quite that much, but we were like, we were a top 5%, if not 1% income household yeah. at that point. And then I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to quit and I'm going to run my business myself. Um, I think I might make $30,000 the first year. And he was like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. And this is like the stock market where you're like, stock market's going to go down and we know that and it's going to be fine. And so I told him our income's going to go down and we know that and it's going to be fine. Um, it was not fine. Turns out when you remove a hundred thousand dollars of income from a household, it can be very stressful. On the other oh, partner. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
So I was changing my, like one of the reasons is I changed my business model for money after graduation, which is another reason the income for that site went down at the same time that I left my job. And yeah, so it was, I was working all the time for about $30,000 a year. And that's really yeah. hard on a marriage when we used to have a very nice life with luxury cars and vacations before. And this was just you spending all of your time making content for Yeah, for well, I was making the courses, right? So Money After Graduation yeah, now yeah. has e-courses and yeah. those are a hugely labor-intensive effort with virtually no payoff in the time it takes to create them. And courses take Yeah, not like, at the time, yeah. Yeah, 2 to 3 months to build the content in a course for $0, oh. dollars, $0 yeah. of income. <laughs> And then once you launch the course, you then have to pay to market it. And this was a thing like, I didn't know if this would work, right? This was just a weird idea that I had that it's I'm so like, tough. oh, I want yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I want to do this and see if it works. And so I was doing always like really annoying things that would drive my ex-husband crazy, like charging $2,000 of Facebook ads to my personal visa and being oh, like, wow. yeah, and being like, it's going to work. Don't worry. Like I believe in me and he's like, I don't believe in you. So that was another um, breakdown there. So I don't know, like in a partnership where you're sharing finances and a life, it can get crazy really fast. <laughs> like your partner's along for the ride and not everyone has the guts for entrepreneurship. And when they're married to an entrepreneur, they don't have a choice. And I think that's really hard. Yeah, because you want to be supportive of people's, des of your partner's desire to do whatever they want to do. But it's hard, uh, like the, when it affects the finances, it's a very different thing, right? Someone wants to pivot, but they're still making the same amount of money or or a little bit less or a little bit whatever. Um, yeah, it, the, the finances just really change everything, right? And this happens all the time. This happens when people want a career change or like, well, yeah. I imagine you, because we were just talking, like, I think you just experienced this as well. Yeah. When like a partner wants to go back to school and it's a huge time and financial investment and it's like, I'm not going to work for this period of time and then my income's going to change. And it's like, it's it's hard on the couple when you're sharing money for sure. Yeah, yeah, we like you know I I I saved up a bunch of money. That was the only reason why I could quit my job when my wife went to, to med school. Uh, but we both quit our jobs, uh, moved, and then a year or so, a year and a half into med school, I had a baby. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like you you can't plan this stuff, right? It's just <laughs> all it happens when it happens. You know, it's um, you know we're, we're not going to be like we have to. Wait until, uh, and you know, as you mentioned earlier, you can't wait forever to have a baby. No, uh, you got to. Well, start you know me; trying. I accidentally had one two years ago. Well, so. yeah. yeah, that I mean, but that's it's like you know, we, I wouldn't want to go back in time or anything, right? And right. change that, right? And and I'm sure you wouldn't either. And uh, you can work through these things, and we find out a lot about ourselves, don't we? Do uh, we ever? <laughs> and what we can to what we can tolerate, and what kind of people we are, and and ideally, we would all find out, uh, you know, out about all these things before we get into relationships or, you know, before, you know, uh, this or that. But, you know, I went through with my addiction. Sometimes you just have some bad parts, right? And yeah. Sometimes there's just them. bad parts in life. Yeah. And hey, thanks again for uh, referring me to, to Vice for that uh, article. Oh, um, no problem. Uh, it was supposed to be for just, you know, let's find somebody who's been through an insolvency. But then uh, Anne from Vice, she liked my story and uh, gave me a feature. So I that saw was, that. that. Yeah, it was really that cool. That was because of you. And she's <laughs> like, Bridget told me, like, because she was like, I'm trying to find people and nobody's, nobody knows anything. And I no one wants nobody... to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's it, right? And you don't want to volunteer anybody, but you n know that I'm open about talking about it, right? So yeah. the, the more we are open about talking about this stuff, the the more people will be able to you know make less mistakes or make them early and i think i think that's important right yeah um, and i mean people should be open again we have like so much shame around money and i i mean the things i say and what i actually feel in practice are still like i'm still working through all um those things too because we just use money so much as a barometer of success and intelligence in life when it's really not <laughs> it's really not but we still perceive it as that and so our struggles with it are attached to that and it feels like we're not being successful or doing the right thing when we manage money wrong when that's not necessarily the case 
Yeah, when I think about like all the accomplishments like the, and the, that you have, <laughs> having a like a science based uh, degree, right? Like uh, being able to get high marks in that, like that's in itself. Like we should all be lucky to be able to to have that kind of knowledge in our heads, mm-hmm. right? Whether you use it actively to make money or not, <laughs> I, I don't think should be very relevant, right? Yeah. To like. Our, you know, our level of success, yeah, that's a success, right? To be able to learn and understand more about the world, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, the unfortunate thing is we do have to make money doing something, right? Exactly. Um, yeah, that and, is the unfortunate thing. So, yeah, so where's the, where's the business at uh, today? And, and uh, you know, like how can people help you make money? What, what would they do? Well, the business is doing pretty well, actually. Money after graduation has grown substantially, particularly in the last year when I actually hired writers. So Amazing. I think you've probably noticed I have a lot of staff. A couple more writers. They, yeah. 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 They create a lot of the content for me and it's better anyway, because <laughs> I'm so far past graduation now that it's <laughs> different. Yeah. So it's nice to get young people in creating the content. And I'm really working hard at making it one of Canada's like most recognizable personal finance brands. And I think it already is, but I yeah. still, I'm, I'm going to take over as long as I can. But I mean, the way to, help it grow and help me is just to visit the site, maybe take some of the e-courses I have. The Six Figure Stock Portfolio is an actual like program that I teach you how to build a $100,000 portfolio. And it's a mix of everything I learned myself, plus my MBA education. And yeah, that, so that's it there. But I just, I just want people to be better with their money. (laughs) Well, that's it. And, and, and yeah, we can talk about that spending, but I'm guessing what, how, how much would the course uh, be if you, do you have a price? Um, the name? course is 379 US. I know yep. Canadians are sometimes shocked that it's in USD, but I had to pick, <laughs> I had to pick one currency and because yeah. like 50% of my traffic is American, that, that was just the easiest one to do. So yeah, it's 379 US. It comes to around or just under $500 Canadian. For that yeah so so you like people are so afraid to spend money i don't know if you uh have caught on to this the but the value like i mean y- you can't just you don't just know this stuff right like you you, you got to learn it and a hands-on course right well and what i tell people like i mean this is a program to build like a hundred thousand dollar plus portfolio and if you can't comfortably spend um yeah. 500, 300 to 500 dollars. You're not at the point that the material in there will even work for you because you have to have capital to put in to the market, like and invest accordingly. But I mean, as far as value goes, now I've had that course out for like three or four years. It's had over 300 people go through it. Um, I'm really proud of it and what it's done. And like, I have a a Facebook group for members and everyone like chats and talks in there, but they've shared like their numbers. Like one person said the course made their investments grow by $67,000 in one year. It was like (laughs) amazing. Yeah. It was like crazy. Like, (laughs) Oh my God. Like I think the people in my course are doing better than me with my own advice. Like it's so (laughs) ironic. Like I even every, every year for the course, I put out um, the top, like uh 50 us stocks top canadian 50 yeah, canadian okay. stocks and top etfs these are just pdfs i give out and like i just did a mid-year check-in on them and like the us stocks were up like 27 percent. and i was like looking <laughs> at this list and i'm like why didn't i just buy like everything that i actually like i bought some of them for myself but i'm like holy crap i just need to start like investing the way i tell other people to invest because everyone else is like oh yeah i bought those and it's doing super well and i'm like i'm literally people are doing better than me in my own program is what's happened there so (laughs) because you're at a different uh stage of your life yeah well like i said in etfs yeah I mean, the course is really based around around that strategy too. Like it's primarily ETFs, but because people are interested in buying stocks, I do say like, here's how to c- choose good individual securities and it works. And so I know like the price point of the course is a little expensive for people, but like you get the value back so fast. Like when people are telling me they gain $67,000 in a year, I'm like, have you ever gotten a better return on 500 bucks? <laughs> Oh my God. Like it, it, if you have any interest in doing this yourself, 
that's what you should do. You should get a course, right? Like yeah. you should, like you could just, you know, I mean, uh, you could take forever to try to figure out how to do it on your own. You could read, you know, uh, Graham's books and, and, uh, well, so or, uh, I made the course cause there was nothing like that, right? Like I'm a yeah. self-taught investor and I read all the books. I subscribed to the magazines. I looked at it all. I, then I went to get an MBA in finance <laughs> and that's, that's right. like, you shouldn't have to do that. So I did all these things. And then like when I finished, I'm like, okay, how can I put all this information in one place where it's easily digestible and useful to people so they don't have to take seven years like I did. And that's what I made. Cause if you take things like the Canadian um, person or like the certified financial planner thing or whatever, it's um, like, it's not the same that teaches you just like how to give people financial advice there's very yeah. little resources actually that are like here's how to build an investment portfolio that will ensure that you become wealthy like there's actually none like i'm one of the only people <laughs> like <laughs> so like this this is it <laughs> i made it yeah. no very few people are in this space yeah like what, what's the harm you're gonna learn and and you get all this, these benefits i i think it's a great thing and you you sacrificed because like you said you don't get paid when you're building a course like this and you you have to do it on faith and hope that it's going to work out and not a lot of people have the ability to do that a lot of people will yeah. not complete making a course or it takes forever it's always on the, the back burner yeah and yeah and now you have this awesome group of people who are <laughs> as you said more successful at it than than you <laughs> even ever imagined uh so that's a hey, that's something to be proud of and it makes uh, yeah. me so happy like i really do love awesome. that like when i hear that i positively impacted someone's life and they do suddenly feel financially secure or they're like it's okay for me to have a family i can buy a house i know that i'll retire comfortably i mean to have had a part of that in someone's yes. life is like so rewarding yeah that is so great and and uh and then the fact that it also uh brings you income there there you go right oh yeah I mean, that's, that's the best that's part. what we like, all need right like we all get rich together yeah exactly right you're helping people which you you know you could have done as a doctor if it would have worked out but you know, you get to help them this way right and and we you know i always say that like i'm not saving lives you know in personal finance uh but sometimes but you kind we, of are. are yeah right because people can end up in some pretty terrible situations, you know, and I was in one. Um, mm -hmm. I, luckily, I never did feel like I, I was at any risk of, of, you know, suicide or anything like that. But a lot of people in my position uh, would have been, right? Oh, yeah, and totally. a lot of people have been. And, and uh, money is just so like that, right? And so, yeah, the more we talk about it like this and the more you make things that help people, you know, the better. And so moneyaftergraduation.com is that it yep anywhere else uh that you want people to go no that's it i mean if they're interested in the course there'll be there's a link that just says e-courses that they can click on right there like you said if they want to follow me on twitter i'm money after grad or my personal one is bridgie casey bridgie casey you got it and then yeah so i do spend a lot of time on the early story and we plow through the uh present day but it's just because we, we want to know your story right that's i talk too much because we didn't even get to the good stuff well like my unplanned baby and stuff <laughs> well are... <laughs> you know what uh, I've, i'm also learning that uh, i can have people on the show again so. <laughs> okay yeah that's also fine <laughs> we can do it yeah we can do the financial impacts of parenthood i bet we you and i can both yeah. have a good discussion about that one <laughs> you know and i think i think that might be where i'm going in the future because you know uh, i can only tell somebody's story once you know their mm -hmm. origin story but i can have them on and we can talk about something specific and i think that's a great idea let's talk about that and how uh, everybody can do it differently and how you don't have to spend $11,000 in, in the first year on a baby. Wouldn't that be nice? You can, yeah. you can easily do that, right? <laughs> uh, but, like, I mean, I feel like I got everything for free, right? There's that oh, that's uh, nice. thing if you have a network, right? So there's, like, so many different stories and so many different, you know, because everybody's got babies, right? So they're all going to tell you how to do it. And uh, that somehow they're all, half of them are wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that is but uh all right so yeah you you will come back on the show and awesome. uh yeah, they're like, you know you got a you got a story you got a lot to talk about i do i'm very chatty you make uh, well you make this content for a living this is what you do <laughs> right this is so of course you have a lot to to say about this and uh yeah so we'll we'll uh, to be continued all right <laughs> sounds good okay cool thanks 
Okay, thanks, Bo. And that was episode 97 with Bridget Casey. If you like the podcast and want to see me get to episode 100, which is coming up real soon, please support the podcast by going to my Patreon site and becoming a patron. Head over to patreon.com slash Bo Humphreys if you're interested. That's it for this episode. I'll be back next week with the host of the Beyond the Dollar podcast, Sarah Lee Kane. <laughs>